Thank you very much for having me here. So there's a piece of grass in uh, New York City that's, that's worth $528 billion. It's right in the core of the busiest city in America. And it's, to me, it's a bit of a metaphor for, for what the future of artificial intelligence could be. The thing I'm talking about is Central Park, you know, and the fact that it survived so long, 170 years, despite the fact that it could have been developed. It really could have been many other things, but it's remained this beautiful green thing in the middle of the city. And so what I want to do is to talk to you a bit about the history of Central Park and what I think it could mean for the future of artificial intelligence. One interesting thing right off the bat is you might think, well, who was behind the idea of Central Park? Who initiated that, that idea? And it wasn't a politician, it wasn't a policymaker, it was a poet. So I'm going to get to that in a minute. First, I want to tell you a bit about my background. I'm currently studying artificial intelligence at the University of Cambridge, and I've had the opportunity to work with different scholars at, at MIT and at Harvard, and as a Google Technology Policy Fellow here in Europe, trying to understand the future of artificial intelligence by looking into the past and understanding the history and the philosophy of this particular technology and trying to fit it into the history of science and technology to, to see how it shapes our understanding of what the future could be. And you might say, well, what exactly is artificial intelligence? Well, first, oh, sorry, I skipped this slide. This is Central Park, as you, I'm sure, are aware. This photo is of uh, a group of guys at what was called the 1956 Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence. So these are the group of guys that actually gave AI its name. And when they, uh, you might wonder, well, what specifically is artificial intelligence? What's the thing that you're talking about there? They defined it this way. They said, the artificial intelligence problem is taken to be that of making a machine behave in ways that would be called intelligent if a humans were so behaving. Now, it's been a long time since then, and artificial intelligence has evolved to mean actually many things. We're currently in the renaissance of a kind of, a, a portion of artificial intelligence which is showing a lot of uh, productivity. We can do things with it. And that's machine learning and deep learning. And if you've never heard these terms before, basically what they are is kind of a, an, a, a, a form of pattern recognition on steroids. So I'll give you an example. This is a human playing a video game. This is some research out of uh, Queen Mary University of London. You know, does pretty well. Pretty boring game, though. Um, this is a, 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 an algorithm playing the same game. When I first saw this, I was blown away. Because if you think, what, what exactly can this tool be used for? There's so many potential uses. And obviously, some are good and some are bad. We have kind of new opportunities, but also new responsibilities in making sure that this is used in the right way. And so I want to talk about some of those. Obviously, you've heard of probably about the risks already, about things like fake news, you know, and disinformation, hyper-targeted advertisements that kind of identify profile you and try and get inside your head and manipulate the way that you think or feel. Or we can think of a, autonomous weaponry being used to, to commit, you know, atrocious things uh, in an autonomous agent. Or you can think of, you know, the changing of jobs that estimates as high as 40% of jobs could change in the future and what this could mean for the kind of traditional social structures that we enjoy. And that while we have these opportunities, we also, or we have these risks, we also have great opportunities. This sort of pattern recognition was used uh, at the University of Stanford last year by a team of researchers that took a corpus of 130,000 images of skin lesions and skin moles that were, that they were trying to look for the signature, the, the pattern in that, in that series of, of data that would identify a cancerous mole. And they succeeded at a level at which they could predict with a higher level of accuracy whether a mole on your body was cancerous than, than 30 uh, board-certified dermatologists. And we're using this pattern recognition in new ways. We're using it to track illegal fishing or to, to catch money laundering as it happens or even to milk cows more efficiently by kind of measuring their behavior and understanding them better. My brother sent me an email recently and he said, he quoted a, 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 the author of Sapiens, Harari said, humans have created such a complicated world that we're no longer able to make sense of what is happening. 
And I think this speaks to the feeling of, that many people have now that we've got these new opportunities and these risks that it's just kind of like, where do you begin? I want to propose that whether, that while this may be true, this is, in a way, it's always been true. I think life has always felt complicated. It's, it's part of what living is, is having to make difficult decisions and sort through complex information. That's part of what artificial intelligence was designed to do, is to help us with those decisions. But I think we can also take hold of our future by identifying some of the pressures that are adding to this feeling. So an example is the fact that democracy, currently, globally, is in the decline. Uh, public trust in democratic institutions is hitting an all-time low. The record, the number of, of, of recognized democratic countries in the world has stalled. It used to, that list used to grow. And simultaneous to this, you know, the internet in the 90s was considered this kind of great, last great hope that, that online we could have a democratic world that, that was too difficult to render offline. And unfortunately, we're finding that, that the infrastructure of the internet well, it was kind of designed and hoped to be an internet, which means a network of networks, is turning into more of a, a trinet, which is a network of three networks, uh, you know, a la Amazon, Google, and Facebook. Facebook today has access to two billion users. Facebook and Google together have direct influence over about 70% of internet traffic and 60% of global advertising spend. This is an, an unprecedented amount of, of, of responsibility and of centralization. And what we're, what we're seeing there is actually happening in, in, with assets as well, with income inequality. That we're seeing a kind of a tendency towards certain groups having just far more than everybody else. The UK House of Commons Library predicted this year that by the year 2030, 1% of the population would have control of two-thirds of global wealth. And this has really perverse effects that I don't think actually benefit anybody. But now, unfortunately, with this new industrial revolution that we're going through, it could make things even worse. In the first industrial revolution, the top 10 industrialized nations, the average income in those nations rose 50 times to more than the lowest 10 industrialized nations. So if we think about what the, the impact of this now, this fourth industrial revolution, of which artificial intelligence is a part, the impact that that could have on society, we have to really be careful not to, not to lose the sort of social norms that have been established by having a, a, a strong center. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we can look at how data is managed. The thing is, unfortunately, with data, it's kind of going the same way. IBM said recently that 90% that, that of the world's data was created in the last two years. And if you look at where that data is stored, sorry, this is <laughs> another one I meant to show before. Uh, when you look at where that data is stored, you see that uh, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of charting the same, income inequality, the same path as income inequality that uh, an organization like Spotify has, has control of 10 petabytes of data, which is about 10 million gigabytes. And eBay has 90 petabytes. Google has 15,000 petabytes. I call this, for lack of a better phrase, intelligence inequality. It's like income inequality, but it's a, it's a stratification about how we have access to data and what we can do with that data. And so when we talk about data, we have to kind of think about it in, in maybe a different way. And there's a couple different views on this. We could talk about it when we, when we think of the metaphor that we use, like, like gold or oil. And when you, when you, uh, you know, extract those things, they're yours to keep, rightfully. That's one option. We could talk about it like intellectual property, that maybe you do have access, sole exclusive access to it for a certain amount of time, but eventually that sunset kind of closes and you have to hand it off to the greater public. Or we could think about it like people. We have gone through history and decided that you cannot own a person. That is ethically wrong. And the thing is with data, is a lot of this data is actually about you. It's what you like to do, it's where you like to shop, it's what you say to your friends, it's your health records. It is a manifestation, it is your, your online, your virtual self. And so when we think about the politics of it, we may want to move away from the idea of owning it towards something more like access and control, so that if you don't like what's happening, you can take back permission that you've given to an organization that's using your data. So another thing we might have to look at is, is whether to really make, make use of this next industrial revolution, capitalism will have to undergo some sort of change. If we, if we optimize for GDP growth or just growth in general, we've seen that this, the, 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 the planet's ecosystems can't support that. 
And so we need to look at new options like, you know, measuring around wellness, for example, in a country, or around, you know, the circular economy, trying to reuse more of what we, uh, what we like to, to, to buy and use. And this brings me back to the metaphor of Central Park, which is what I'd introduced. So Central Park was built in the, it was, the idea of it came about in the mid-19th century. And as I mentioned, it was a poem, a poet, a man named William Bryant, who had the idea. And so Bryant went to his friends and he kind of rallied up support and he managed to convince enough people, enough people liked the idea of, of preserving a set set of land in the middle of the city for everybody, that they, did, that they, they got eventually government approval to seize 700 acres from the middle to, to, to keep to this day. The interesting thing that we have to remember here looking into the history is if we wanted to try this again, we'd have to make sure to learn from the lessons of that period. This is Bryant here. One of the lessons is there were 1,700 people, families, that lived in the area that was seized to make Central Park. Primarily uh, immigrant families and African-American families who lives were totally disrupted by this decision. They had no say over the decision. Uh, the government would come in and, and, and find them in dance halls and kick them out. They made it, uh, they would charge them rent for the land if they refused to leave, even though it was their land. And then ultimately they paid them less than, than the market value of what they were owed. And this is something that we have to keep in mind as artificial intelligence enters the world is we have to make sure even if we're doing things in the name of good that we're, rep that we're respectful to the disparities, the existing power dynamics and disparities that exist in the world today. So let's, let me give you an example. In the state of Kentucky now, they're using machine learning in the criminal justice system. The idea is, let's use the brilliance of AI, this ability now to, 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 to find patterns that humans couldn't find to, to predict crime. The trouble is, whether or not that is the right approach, in my mind, the solution really should be, how do we resolve the things that cause crime? So rather than predicting, you know, this person's gonna do this, why not predict, why would that person do this? Why not measure, for example, broken homes and optimize for the, try to adopt policies that, that lower the number of broken homes or improve our education in the schools or improve the safety of neighborhoods? Things like this. Another group that's potentially vulnerable here are young people. There was a report out last year that found that between 20 and 40% of young people um, in the OECD are at risk of having their jobs automated. And the reason is that young people often work the sort of jobs that are entry-level jobs. You know, that's how they enter the workforce. And so traditional jobs in retail or in accommodation or in food services, like this Burger King that I was in in Moscow recently, are no longer being operated by people. And those jobs aren't being offered to people, they're being offered to machines. 56% of young people today say that the hardest struggle they're, ever, they're going to confront in their life is finding a permanent job. That number rises to 64 if you ask young women. And so we have to think through how to kind of distribute this new wealth that AI will, will unlock equally in a way that benefits all of us, which brings us back again to Central Park. So what I've talked about here is complexity, right? We're dealing with a lot of different variables and a lot of different social spaces at the same time. And the solution I want to propose, at least for now, is a list. I've personally in my life seen the power of what a list can do. When I was in high school, my brother and his friends went on a camping trip to celebrate graduation, and accidentally his, his good friend Rob drowned on the last night. And out of that experience, coming home from that, we, we thought a lot about life and why we're here. And he and I and two friends decided to write a list of everything we wanted to do before we died. We were teenagers. And then try and do each and every one of these things. And for every one we got done, we were going to help one stranger do something that they had always wanted to do. And to our amazement, we were actually able to get some of this stuff done. Small things at first, like, uh, you know, we wanted to uh, make a toast at a stranger's wedding. Uh, or, uh, you know, deliver a baby. Things that we actually did manage to do to feel what these things would be like. And we also managed to do some impossible things, like number 95, play basketball with the President of the United States, Obama, at the White House. And the thing that I found doing this project is that sometimes the impossible things are actually easier than the, than the, than the, than the less impossible things because they make people want to participate. It's a shared vision that, that people want to be a part of. And that's what I see in Central Park. It's something that all of us can benefit from. And so to close, what I want to offer are a list, an introductory list of four things that we can think of as, the, as we enter this kind of new era with AI. Number one 
is that we need to learn from the past and learn the importance of deadlines. There is a window, there was a window of opportunity in which we could have constructed Central Park. That window has closed. If, 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 if Central Park hadn't been built and there had just been skyscrapers, you could not now go and knock on doors and say, hey, we're, you know, we're kicking you out now. We're gonna, you, you would need $528 billion to buy the land back. So number one, there is an opportunity right now while AI is still kind of in this beginning stages that we can lay down the rules of how this is gonna work. Number two, local ownership personal ownership by you guys, or just management through what I, not my term, but the idea of data trusts. A data trust is based on the idea of a land trust that was originated in the UK. And that's how you, you manage a really beautiful piece of land is you, you assign responsibility to a set of trustees and they make sure that the land is protected in the sort of ways that, uh, that the people that participate want it to be. And this is an effective model to move past ownership and towards stewardship. So you could give your data to a representative body that would respect your needs and your kind of informational self. The third thing is to think of responsibility at a global level and to align the development of AI with existing lists. Two examples. Number one, the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Number two, the International Real Bill of Human Rights. In my mind, these can be the corridors. This can be the blueprint from which AI is built. Just like Fifth Ave and 59th Street set the boundaries of Central Park, these, these mandates that we have collectively determined that we want for our society can be the, the, the terms by which we negotiate the future of AI. This is the final thing, and perhaps the most important thing, is to believe in yourself. People say, you know, everyone's curious, how will AI influence the future of society? I think that's only half the question. The other half is, how will society impact the future of AI? And you play an important role in that. So in thinking through the future and remembering that technology is a means and not an end, think about what sort of future you want and how we can get there, how we can use AI to get you there. And if you're watching this at home, leave your ideas in the comments, share with your friends, and tell me in the audience afterwards what it is that you want for your future. Thank you so much.